Hello everyone. Welcome to 75th CA Day celebrations hosted by Tally Solutions. Uh, today on this occasion, let me, your moderator, Janak Lotwala, welcome you formally for the evening, the dignitaries and the members from the ICI. We are ecstatic and delighted uh, to have you on this forum today. Uh, friends, in today's digital era, there are two things which are very important for professionals. First is the ability to communicate across multiple uh, channels, be it online, offline. And second is uh, developing some workable understanding of data security, especially when dealing with confident, uh, confidentiality in today's time. Uh, we will have speakers and experts speaking on both these areas extensively over the next couple of hours. But before we formally commence, I would request CA Prakash Sarma, sir, uh, chairman of the chairman of the ICI CMP, uh, to share his thoughts and open the forum formally for the discussion. Uh, Prakash, sir, over to you. Thank you, thank you, dear uh, friends. I welcome you all in this very very important year. On this first of July. Our institute has entered in the 75th year of our profession, where we are going to have lots of functions, lot of events. Uh, you all may be knowing on 1st of July, our uh, President of India, Honorable Mrs. Mormar, was uh, with us in the institute to uh, inaugurate our this particular year for organizing different platforms, different programs. Here I would like to place my sincere regards and thanks to Tele organization who is always playing very important role in the society as well as for the CA professionals, for CA members, as well as students, as well as all the stakeholders who are linked with the audit and accounts of this country. So uh, looking to all the things, the way things are changing due to change of 5G technology, I'm very sure uh, Delhi has come out with its latest version, that is version 3. I'm very sure that it is going to be very, very useful for we all. Friends, uh, I will not take much of the time, but like to uh, thank the organizers for organizing today. Very good two topics, which are very, very important, especially for the chart accountants, that is critical thinking and communication as well as data security, which are both are very, very burning topics for the CA professionals, whether he's in job or is in practice or in business. So I will not take much of the time. Uh, again, my sincere thanks to Tele Organization for organizing this uh, particular event in the year when we are going to have whole year so many different programs. And let me assure you facts that at institute level also, we are going to have so many uh, updating, up knowledgeing programs for our members. So over to you, MC. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. Uh, happy to uh, have your experience on the forum. Uh, and now uh, we also have uh, CA Thamaya on this forum with us. C.A. Thamaya, who heads the corporate finance function at Tally, uh, he is responsible for key financial and legal aspects, including that of business finance, treasury, taxa treasury taxation, uh, secretarial and procurement. He is member of ICI. Just hold on. He is member of ICI and has over 19 years of work experience across organizations, including Tally. With that, let me request C.A. Thamaya, sir, to share his thoughts and welcome note before we comment, uh, commence on to the remaining remainder of the session. Uh, over to you, Thamaya, sir. Right. Thank you very much, Janak. Um, and a special thank you to CA Prakash Sharma. It's FCA Day. Uh, I would like to express my sincere appreciation. Join us in celebrating this significant milestone. In fact, the celebration provides us an opportunity to express our gratitude to the countless chartered accountants who have tirelessly worked to build a prosperous future for our society. Tally has had a remarkable partnership with CAs, and this has played a significant role in shaping Tally's product development, helping us deliver products that simplify accounting processes. The feedback, insights, 
and expertise we received is an invaluable resource, allowing us to stay ahead of the curve. Tally holds a special place in the hearts of every CA, just as CAs hold a special place in Tally's family. While CA stands for Chartered Accountant, it also stands for Computerized Accounting. Today, Tally is synonymous with Computerized Accounting, and as such, there's always a Tally's presence in every CA's journey. As we look ahead, I'm confident that this partnership with CAs and Tally will continue to soar to new heights, and together, we will celebrate the 100th year with even more grandeur. Thank you. And uh, Janak, over to you. Thank you, Tamaya, sir, for sharing your uh, thoughts with us. Uh, now, uh, moving on ahead in the session. Uh, before we move on, I would like to share one anecdote uh, with everyone on this forum. Uh, communications is a very fundamental topic, and we'll be covering that shortly. We have a very keynote, uh, experienced keynote speaker uh, sharing his thoughts on same. The reason why we have chosen and called communication to be fundamental is because communication is something which is very essential, obviously for everyone, but even more so necessary uh, for professionals who deal with stakeholders across the spectrum of uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, uh, be it government, be it business owners, or be it having peers in different towns across the country, tier one towns, tier two towns. Uh, and definitely we have somebody who has a lot of experience in sharing his, uh, in the work that he has done. Uh, Dr. Rahul Shukla is with us on this forum. Dr. Rahul Shukla is a chairman, general management area from uh, XLRI, Xavier Institute, uh, uh, Xavier School of Management. He has been a recipient of the Fulbright Fellowship and prestigious StarTalk Fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. At UPenn, he has successfully completed an international uh, second language acquisition project titled New Direction, New People. Professor Shukla has been actively involved in teaching courses like managerial communication, leadership communication, and communicating critical decisions in different postgraduate programs at XLRI Jamshedpur. Further, he designed a customized course titled uh, Human Resource Communication for Aspiring CHROs delivered at the Delhi campus of the XLRI Jamshedpur. He has been conducting corporate training sessions in interpersonal communication, influence and persuasive communication, leadership communication, critical and analytical thinking, and rational decision making. He has designed and delivered corporate training programs for senior leadership of ArcelorMittal Nippon, uh, Indian Overseas Bank, Nabard, Maruti Suzuki, uh, um, CTS Tech, NTPC, Tata Steel, Indian Oil Corporation, Tata Power, Tata Technologies, etc. Prior to joining XLRI, he taught uh, business and managerial communication at IIM Ahmedabad, Symbiosis International University, Entrepreneurship Development Institute of India in Ahmedabad, JP, uh, JP University of Information Technology, Solan. Currently, he is also associated with IIM Kozikod as adjunct professor and I am uh, Kashipur as a visiting professor. With that introduction, let me hand over the forum to Dr. Rahul Shukla and uh, sir, please, if you can have some thoughts around today's interesting and fascinating area of communication. Thank you, Mr. Janak. I guess I'm audible to you, right? Yes, you are very much audible. Sir. So thank you. Uh, just. Uh... A quick check, uh, how much time do I have to talk about this topic? Sorry, you are not audible, sir. You have to unmute yourself. Komal, we have 40 minutes, right? Yeah. Okay, fair enough. So, so you can take 45 minutes or even more than that. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being so generous. And thank you, Jenna, for being so very generous to give such an amazing introduction. Uh, so kind of you. So to quickly start with, uh, lots of things have been told about communication. Uh, we say that communication is very important, but we don't know if it works, right? That's the question we keep asking. Now, when you are in a college or a school, mostly communication is associated with skills. It stands for LSRW, listening, reading, writing, and speaking, right? We all know how to read, we all know how to write, we all know even how to listen, and we also know how to speak. Right? There's no problem with it. But for instance, when it comes to speaking to your bosses, when it comes to speaking to your friends, when it comes to speaking to your colleagues, when it comes to talking to somebody who you don't like, 
Even when we are very fluent at communication, we struggle. Not that only we struggle, we also sometimes don't know what I'm saying, how is it going to impact others, right? So when we talk about communication and critical thinking, we try to apply the understanding of critical thinking and communication and try to make our communication more efficient, right? So I'm not going to give you this kind of a theory. I know that if I talk a lot like this, definitely you will get intimidated thinking communication is something amazing, which is super amazing. Sometimes it's so dangerous, it's so difficult. It's not at all like that. I will just give you a few inputs on what is critical thinking. How does it get into communication and how does it make communication more effective, right? Those are the things we are going to discuss. And I will help you understand it with a few examples because there's Mr. Arvind, we had a long talk with him yesterday. I and other team members, I guess from Tally itself. And I tried to understand the nature of audience. And he told me that people from different backgrounds will be there. Definitely same kind of an academic background, but like you work with in different domains and you also work with different clients. So keeping that in mind, I, have, I will try to keep it simple. My request is that if you have any questions or doubts, please uh, put them in the chat so that I can take up those questions while talking. And even, I guess we will have some Q&A part towards the end, right? Because in my classes, uh, definitely I want people to talk because that's what communication means, right? So let's start, uh, not wasting your time. So what is critical thinking and communication, right? So I always love to start with a small little anecdote, which normally, uh, anecdote was for me, now it's a kind of a culture which I've seen in markets where we negotiate a lot, right? So what happened once was, I went to a market in Delhi where I wanted to buy something. And I suddenly got interested in that stuff. So because, and that place was Sarojini. If you are from Delhi, you might know, you might have heard of it. And this particular market is very well known for negotiation. If you are good at negotiation, you will get amazing stuff in that market. So I went inside that market. Uh, it was my first time at that time in, in this place because I come from another city. So I went to a place, I liked a particular t-shirt, I wanted to buy that t-shirt and this person very smartly tried to change the price of that particular t-shirt, right? So that t-shirt was uh, of about 1000 bucks and uh, he, that's what he told. And later I got to know that he actually normally sells that, that particular t-shirt at 200 rupees. And when I bought it, I bought it at around 700. When I came home, I showed it to a few friends. Came home, came home means I was staying with a friend. So when I showed it, he said, Raul, you can find this t-shirt in just 200 bucks. You have been cheated, right? So what happened, I would tell you, and I, I will try to tell you in a way that you might have come across the same problem in these places, right? If you're not using critical thinking. So for instance, you go to a market, right? You like something, you like a product, a particular product too much. Like for instance, you like a, a t-shirt like this, right? You like this t-shirt and you are, the way you touch it, the way you feel it, the way you look at it, these people who are sitting behind the counters, they know that you are there to buy. You're not there to bluff, right? So based on your body language or your normal communication, they get to know that you're definitely going to buy. So they will walk up to you and they will ask a question like this, that, sir, are you interested to buy it? Yes, you say, yes, I'm interested in buying it. So they would say, okay, uh, there's a price for it, 1000 bucks. So you would say no, because you've been told that, uh, you've been told that, okay, you've been told that uh, sometimes when you are in these markets, you have to cut the price. So you reduce the price, for instance, by 700 rupees. You say, I am ready to pay 300 rupees for this particular t-shirt. So they use another strategy, smart strategy. They would say, you want it in 300, it's 1000, okay, let me reduce it. And they will say, we'll only charge you 600 rupees, give it to us, oh, give the money, you take the t-shirt. And then you are like, okay, why? Because uh, I want to only pay 300, they will say, no, you are paying very less amount, we are giving you a right amount, and it should be neither yours nor mine, 600 is an amount, which is neither yours nor mine, please take it in 600 rupees, right? Uh, you feel uh, uncomfortable, you don't want to move beyond 300 because that's what you have decided. You've been told that when you are in a place like Sarojini, you have to actually place a price and then you don't have to move that price, right? So you're not moving. So what this person will do is, sometimes they'll try to hurt your ego, right? So what they would do suddenly, they would say that you cannot buy them. In 300, you cannot buy them. 
if you are not smart you may get hurt when they say such a thing and they such a, say such a thing in such a rude way that definitely goes into your heart so sometimes you get offended saying okay how, how can you say i cannot buy and you will end up paying maybe 600 but if you are smart you will say no i will not pay beyond 300 want to give give otherwise i'm leaving so what they would do is they would take this t-shirt from your hand they will keep it right in front of you in one of these shelves and then they will give you another t-shirt he said take this one up huh? this is only of 250 rupees i can further reduce it to 200 rupees right the one which you wanted they quoted for it 600 and now they are not reducing the price and they have introduced another t-shirt which they are claiming that it's of 250 rupees and you can get it in only 200 rupees. Now, normally what happens when you go through this scenario, you start thinking that the product which was shown to you initially, that was of a better quality, right? You believe it's a better quality product. It has, uh, you know, uh, maybe the price is actually right. 600 is a correct price. So you stop negotiating on this one, or you even don't like to look at this one. You want to actually get the one which was shown earlier. So you would say, no, no, I'm not interested in this one, even if you are giving me it in 200. Can you give me that which you have quoted for 600? Can you give it to me in 500? He would say, no, that you, I don't want to discuss, right? That's over. And then because you were interested in it, you would end up paying some 600 rupees for it, right? And when you come home, show it to your family, they would say, All right, same t-shirt, you can get it 150 rupees. So when they do such a thing with you, actually they try to play with your thinking process this is called a decoy strategy so what this person has done to you is this person first introduced the product right which you liked you wanted to pay a particular amount of it and they know that you are not ready to buy they take that away and introduce another object to distract you now when that new object is introduced you stop negotiating on the one you wanted to buy and Ultimately, you buy that product in a price which was placed by the seller, right? This is what is happening everywhere. We get into this all the time. It happens because we don't use our critical thinking skills. This is one of the areas where I'm telling you that we lose on our products or lose on our you know, price or money because we are not using critical thinking skills. There's another scenario with that. Sometimes when you are in these areas, they will say, come, 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 I will uh, not charge any money. You come and sit with us. We will show you our, our, our products. Please sit with us, watch. We will not charge anybody, anything. For seeing, we will not charge you anything, right? You get excited. You feel like, okay, this person is calling me. Let me sit and see what he or she has, right? You sit there and they say, sir, do you want to see t-shirts? You say, okay, show the t-shirts. You have only called me to sit and see. So they will make you sit there. And they will keep opening t-shirts after t-shirts in front of you. And in some time, you will realize that in front of you, 30, 40 t-shirts are lying. And you develop a feeling of guilt. That if this person has put so much effort to put so many t-shirts in front of me, let me buy one. And initially, they said, sir, please come and see. We are not charging you for looking at our stuff. And you end up buying. This again is happening, but because we are poor at critical thinking skills, right? So what is critical thinking, right? That's an enigma. So I very proudly tell in every forum that this discipline critical thinking actually as a course was introduced by me at Excel I'm sure it's my elective. It's called critical communicating critical decisions. And I also created a course for I am Kashipur, which is called critical thinking course along with Professor Moni Pali, he's from I am Ahmedabad, retired. We both created this course outline and I even taught that course in I am Kashipur, which is actually on critical thinking. So I was the first guy to start a, 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 a specific course on critical thinking in any of the these schools in India. And it's a very interesting domain, right? So just, just to help you understand why I'm talking about critical thinking so much. So what is critical thinking, right? That's the question you might be thinking about, right? Simple definition of critical thinking is asking questions from different perspectives. Now you might be surprised, what does it mean? It means a lot, right? Like for instance, uh, when I say asking questions so, or what does it mean? Uh, just let me show you something on the screen, right? Uh, so uh, if we look at this screen for now, just to say I'm showing you a small little uh, picture. Huh? So, If you look at this picture right on the screen, 
what is your reaction to this picture if you can just quickly put your comment in the uh, uh, chat if you have if you can write what do you think about this map on the screen which i am actually presently exhibiting right just tell me what is your quick reaction on this map anybody just quickly if you can chat chat toy type a few words over there the map is inverted sir actually names are correct but the map is inverted right right world map is inverted right amazing right upside down map world map right it just seem to be wrong actually when i was i got literally lost where is india here <laughs> Correct, correct. Thank you, thank you. So lots of comments are coming. World map, world map upside down. Now, if you are a critical thinker, you will ask this question: Ki Actually, is there anything upside or downside when it comes to the globe? Because when you move outside this planet, there is no direction, right? There is no up, there is no down, there is no left, there is no right, there is no east, there is no west. Nothing. We have created those directions on this planet because we wanted to give meaning or we wanted to give some kind of precision to what we are doing, right? Then how come we are giving directions or we are putting directions to the map when there are no directions, right? Definitely that precision helps. But why have we not told that there is nothing like up north, down south? It can be up south, down north. It can be up east, down west. Why has it never been told to us? This is the first question, right? Now, there is an argument for that too, right? For instance, if we go by the Western scholars, they say that North is always on the top for one simple reason, that when the navigators of the European countries used to navigate in the sea, they would get guided by the North Star, which we call Pole Star. In Sanskrit, it's called Dhruv, Dhruv Tara, right? So at that time, because North was on the top, they would actually keep North on the top, and that is why North has become the top of any map. Okay, it's fair enough. But before these Europeans hit the sea, these, all these seas, be it Atlantic or Pacific, right, the major seas, they were controlled by Chinese navigators and Arab navigators. And they kept east on the top because they got guided by the position of sun, right? Why was it not told to us that there is nothing like north on the top or south on the top or east on the top or west on the top? It's based on convenience, right? But it has never been told, so we never question because we all are linear in our thinking. And because we are linear in our thinking, we don't like to question, so we never question. And we always think that, okay, they are sitting over us, not northern people, right? For instance, Europeans, they are sitting over us, but it can be a part of a design also, right? Now, because you know, Ptolemy, scholars like Ptolemy always said that they're guided by North Star. So they said that because of that only we are keeping North. But you should have also told that Chinese navigators or Arab navigators use Sun. So East can also be on the top, but we were never told. That was, that's a small question. Huh? Let's try to understand it better. If you look at this map and see India, as our friend was saying, you know, Mr. Janak was saying, I could not locate India, now it's on the top, right? When you look at the entire map, if you see Northern countries, they are huge. Russia is huge, Canada is huge, Alaska is huge. On the top of everything, Greenland is so huge. But technically, they are not huge. If you go by the right map, they are actually not that big. You can put three North Americas in Africa. Africa is this huge. But on this map, it appears so small. And forget other countries, talk about our continents, talk about our country. India appears so small on this map, right? That small yellow thing. But India is seventh largest country when it comes to area in the world. And we have never been told that the map which we are using, which we call the world map is inaccurate. Because they claim that if you spread the spherical globe on the plain sheet of paper, it will actually expand the countries in the north and shrink the countries in the south. It was never true. So if you are not educated, for instance, or if you are partially educated or you are close to illiteracy, but still you can read or see or and make sense. You may always think India is so small and we are 1.4 billion people, right? I'm not saying, I'm not saying that we should keep increasing population. I'm not saying talking about that also. But point is, India is not that small the way we are told. India is not small, actually. We are seventh largest country in the world when it comes to India. So as a critical thinker, you have to understand one small little thing that you need to ask questions. 
questions about everything you see. Even the facts which have been established, they can be questioned. Right? If you're not asking questions, people may force you to become linear. So if somebody is convicted, you would think that this person is a criminal. If somebody is acquitted, you would think that this person is a nice person. But that may not be the case. A person can get acquitted even if that person has committed a crime because of the lack of evidence. And a person can get convicted even if the person is innocent because there are some circumstantial evidence. Right? So you cannot be linear all the time. And this non-linearity is called critical thinking. Right. So again, coming back to the first example I gave you all, when you, for instance, go to a market like Sarojini and you try to argue, right? There, if you think like this product on which he's not arguing is actually of a better quality, you are not using your critical thinking skills. You are using your linear thinking skills. But if you are a critical thinker, you will say, tell me you are giving it this particular t-shirt in 250 bucks and you are giving that in 600. Tell me the difference. Explain the difference. Most of the time they will not discuss that. Right? Because they know that if they discuss, they will have to give logic. And if they will have to give logic, they will get caught. That's why those who try to manipulate you, those who try to play with your brain, they will never give you an opportunity to discuss anything with you. Because they know that when they discuss, they may get caught. Because when you discuss things, you will have to, they will have to come up with logic. And that's why they are very weak. Right? So critical thinking says you ask questions. But can you ask any questions? No. You need to have reasonable skepticism. Right? When I say reasonable skepticism, where you think it is right to ask questions. Right? Like for instance, when I go to my family, I cannot ask my mother, say, tell me how much you love me. Prove it. That's difficult. Don't use critical thinking over there. But when you are doing business, right? And somebody is saying you invest in it. Right? You need to ask questions. What will be my benefit in this investment? What is my return on this investment? If you are doing that, you are using critical thinking. So the simple formula of applying critical thinking is ask why questions. And at least for five times, ask why questions. Like why, 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 why? When you ask questions like why, 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 at least for five times, you go to the root cause of any problem, right? And even if when people are giving you reasons, you keep asking, so what? Because when you say, so what? You check the validity of their questions or their reasons, or the rationale they are trying to give. So keep asking why, keep asking so what. And when you are done with all the reasons these people have shared, don't end your conversation. Say, what else do you have? So the more you probe, the more you are in control of the other party. Right? So this is this is one of the scenarios. So there is author. His, his name is Daniel Kahneman. He has written a very beautiful book called Thinking Fast and Slow. He says that normally, those who are linear thinkers, they use system one thinking. What is system one thinking? Just think the way things are. Don't put your thinking to testing, right? Don't evaluate whatever you are going to. That's system one. But when it comes to system two thinking, you evaluate everything, which is hard, which brain doesn't like. Brain likes those things which are easy, which are simple, which are based on something you have done in the past. Your brain will enjoy. That's why when you take up a new assignment, when you do something new, something very different from what you have done in the past, you become uncomfortable. Why? Because your brain, your brain doesn't know how to handle them. So brain is creating patterns to handle those things in future. But once you are perfect, your brain will say, okay, you can enjoy now. Issue is, brain keeps telling us that if things are complicated, right, I will not get into them. Because for me, you have to create patterns, which I don't like. If things are simpler, based on what I know from the past, I will definitely love that. So we prefer to do those things which your brain loves. But you remember one thing, if you are comfortable in doing something, you're not learning. Because your brain is using patterns from the past. But if you are uncomfortable in doing something, if you are putting yourself to testing, if you are putting your skills to testing, you have to understand that your brain is learning the most. That's why it is always said that magic happens, learning happens in the zone of discomfort, not in the zone of comfort. Right? So if you want to sharpen your critical thinking skills, when you want to develop your perspective, when you want to understand a problem from different viewpoints, you need to actually make yourself believe that the way you think is not always the right way. So you question yourself, you doubt yourself, you doubt your skills. And that is why you even question your understanding. So according to a scholar called William Perry, he says that 
if you really want to be very sharp at critical thinking skills start thinking that if you only rely on what you know you are actually a level 1 thinker which is a state of duality because you have read something and you believe this is right because i have read then slowly when you start start thinking or start believing that others can also be right because they also read something and you are also right because you have said something you start getting into another level or got, got into an or onto another level or get into another kind of a scenario where you actually start believing that everything is relative even your truth is relative or your knowledge is relative and that state or that particular level is called the level of relativity where you believe you are right because you have read something and you also believe that others are equally right because they have also read something right but that is also not a right kind of a state you have to move to from this state to another state which is the final state which is called a state of commitment you know you are right because you have read something but you also know that you can be wrong because what you have read can also be questioned and if somebody is giving you a better logic which questions your logic definitely you change your mind that is called a state of commitment and it is very difficult for all of us to reach it why because we never like to question what we know so critical thinking says question everything but when i teach this in my training programs or in my classes students or participants ask this question is that if we start asking questions from everybody on everything people will not like us that is correct critical thinkers are not appreciated why because they question the processes when you question the processes processes will get changed so new processes will have to get established and for that particular period the entire system will get disrupted but we all have to understand that if these people are not in the systems your processes will not improve so you need to have and there is this famous scholar his name is rv sparkman he has written a book on manipulation he says that only 5% people use critical thinking skills other 95% are linear they think like a straight line right they have straight line rationality they have straight line thinking process so they never question so keep asking these three questions why 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 so what so what so what what is what is what is so when you do that you probe you get into the context you try to understand the rationale behind the reasons shared at the same time you look for more that's why you say what else so this is the first step of critical thinking or understanding critical thinking i was talking about daniel kahneman he says if you develop system two you always are ahead of others right like there is another scholar his name is uh, nasim nicolas taleb he has written a very beautiful book called black swan right i'm sure you would have heard of this work very popular work in that work he says for instance uh, you know we all thought that future was linear before covid right though the book was written written much before covid but he talks about unprecedented incidents right and you can apply that theory on covid before covid we thought everything would be linear right life is amazing we are ruling life we are controlling everything we are going to mars we are going to the moon we are doing so many things we are in control of everything one small virus stopped everything in india for two years we were stuck right we could not do anything why because we thought life is linear right whatever we are doing is enough to control our future that's what's called forecasting right you pick your past data analyze that past data and try to think that okay future will be like this so future our future is like this that's not correct approach life is not linear right many companies thought that they would do wonders in 2020 but from february onwards they could see the bleak future and in march and april all the companies were shut down in india people were not working we were all stuck in our homes how can you think life is linear so that is where you have to understand that you need to question this linear path itself and that is why there is something called scenario planning these days companies get into creative scenarios instead of forecasting only so forecasting definitely is important because you want to see your present and future along with what you see your as the present and future you try to understand there can be creative futures as well like for instance if there is an alien attack tomorrow what will we do now people will laugh at it right this particular virus covid itself was an alien right that's why our bodies were not prepared to handle it similar attacks can happen in future are we mentally prepared that's the question we need to ask so when you ask questions right when you use nasim nicolas taleb or if you use our friend called daniel kahneman they always try to or they always make a point 
in their works that please question, please doubt. Because the more you doubt, the better you become. And asking questions is equally important as giving answers, right? Let me give a mythological reference, right? I am sure you would have heard of Bhagavad Gita, right? If Arjun had not asked right questions, Lord Krishna would have not given the amazing answers in Bhagavad Gita, right? So we need to understand that questions are equally important. Definitely answers are important, right? But if questions are not asked or right questions are not asked, you will not get the right content. Lord Krishna might know lots of things. He was sitting on a you know, huge body of knowledge. But because Arjun asked right questions, the right kind of knowledge came in that particular episode, right? So asking questions is important. Challenging is important. But there are two areas where you should not ask or use critical thinking. I'm specifically mentioning that. One is religion, another is politics. Why religion? Because anything which is based on somebody's personal beliefs, if something is based on somebody's personal value system, you should not ask questions, right? If I like blue color, it's my personal choice. Why should I tell you why I like blue color? That's my color. You like red color, it's your color. So if I like this God, that God, my God lives in the sky, my God lives in, you know, river, it's my personal choice. So never ask or never use critical thinking when it comes to religion or never use critical thinking when it comes to politics, right? Because politics is also based on personal beliefs, right? Anything which is based on personal beliefs or personal value system, that should not be questioned using critical thinking. But yes, please ask questions wherever it is important and wherever it is important for the growth of your organization, for the growth of your people, right? So before I move on, right? Because I've just given you a background of critical thinking. Uh, let me just quickly ask you one quick question because you all are numbered people. That's what I have identified, right? So tell me what is your, the next number in this series uh, which you see on the screen. Just put your responses in your chat box. I will see uh, and I will then reply. So there is a series 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 9, 10, 12. What's the next number? Tell me. Okay, 14, 15. 14, wow. Oh, 13, wow. 9 has created confusion. Correct. 14, 17, wow. 14, 13. Right. 14, 16, 19. Okay, thank you, thank you. I guess uh, I, wow, nice. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Ah, this is good. This is good. Nice. Fair enough. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So let me quickly stop you here because we have limited time. No, we have just 45 minutes. I will try to take a little bit more of the time, but still, uh, I'm very happy that you people are writing your responses here. Now, when you look at this series, huh, just I'm just helping you understand. If you're a critical thinker, if you're a linear thinker, if not a critical thinker, you will look at this series and think that, okay, two is there, four is there, six is there, eight is there. What is this nine doing in the middle? Somebody wrote it in the comment also. Nine is creating a confusion. And then you see 10 and 12, right? Then you see 10 and 12. So your brain will say two, four, six, eight are even numbers. Nine is an odd number. 10 and 12 are even numbers. So it can be like this, two, four, six, eight, nine, 10, 12, 14, 16, then maybe 17, right? Or you will pick another pattern on the same lines, right? Four, four even numbers, one odd number, two, two even numbers, one odd number, one even number, one odd number, something like that, right? Now, point is, point is, when you look at this series, this is the point I want to make. Somebody asked this question, why have you asked this? Right, why have you asked this, Mr. Jawahar is saying. So I will tell you why have I asked this. When you look at such a series, your brain uses patterns which have been taught to you when you were in a second grade, when you were in a third grade, first grade, that there is an event series and there is an odd series. And when you look at this series now, that brain is still, that information is still controlling it. You see two, four, six, eight, wow. Then you see nine, oh, what is it doing? 10, 12. If you're a linear thinker, you will always use the knowledge of the past and that will create confusion or chaos. Or if not confusion or chaos, it will only give you same results which you could have received or achieved when you were in second standard or third standard of your school. But now if I have to look at it non-linearly, 
can I create my own rationale of this particular series? Why do I have to go by the logic which was taught to us when we were kids? Right? So I will just say that this is a progressive series. 4 is bigger than 2. 6 is bigger than 4. 8 is bigger than 6. 9 is bigger than 8. 10 is bigger than 9. 12 is bigger than 10. So next number will be 12.1. Any bigger number, more than 12 can be the next number. Why do I have to use the logic which was given to us when we were kids? And when, then we say that we have to think out of the box. Right? That is the problem. Because we never try to question our own thinking. We believe whatever we are using is the right tool. Right? So, when you start imagining like this, right? When you start questioning, when you start looking for patterns which are not there, you are actually getting into critical thinking. So, one question I'm leaving you for, right? Try to find the answer of this question. Right? There's a beautiful book called Humans Are Not From Earth, right? Just, just think like this, that, okay, if we have been brought from any other planet and have been put over here by any other race, right, which is much advanced, and they have just kept it here because they, that's their simulation, they are watching us, right, can there be a possibility of it? Many of you will say, no, there, there is no possibility. We have put a telescope, we want to see what is happening outside the planet, we know if there is any sound, noise. Just try to understand that when you're trying to look for any life outside this planet, what kind of life are you looking for? You are looking for a life which is like you, right? You are looking for a life based on your five senses, right? Because that is how we interpret everything. That is how we try to interpret everything, right? But we all have to understand one important thing that our five senses which humans have may not be enough to interpret everything which is happening around us. Take an example of an animal called reindeer, right? For instance, for instance, reindeer can see ultraviolet rays with its naked eyes. We all know, right? Humans cannot. Humans could only see ultraviolet rays when they used what is called a lens. We extended our senses. We are weak, even on this planet. Many animals are way different and smarter than us in many senses. And we believe we can understand everything, right? Another example, birds can see different colors in the sky. Humans can see only one color, that is blue. Based on different colors, birds decide whether they want to soar very high or not. But for human beings, it's always one color. There also we are actually incapable of understanding what kind of weather it will be today or in the upcoming days. Birds can understand that. Forget that when it is about to, to ask for the earth to quake, quake, right? If it is about to have an earthquake, right? You will never get to know anything. You will sit in your bedroom, you will watch TV. But if you have animals at home, they will get to know before it actually strikes that earthquake is about, about to happen. How come they get to know that? So they are better equipped, they have better senses, right? Or I will not say better, but their senses are definitely you know, smarter than our senses. So on this planet itself, there are animals, there are creatures, right? Who, have, who are better equipped than us. And we believe that we can interpret the entire universe based on our five senses. So critical thinking says that you have to understand that we have our own limitations. And whatever we have proved so far, discovered so far, established so far, is based on our limited understanding. And if it is a limited understanding, we need to keep questioning it so that it becomes better. But somebody wrote in the chat, chat box that asking too many questions is also irritating for, in, for instructors. It can be irritating, but if your questions are meaningful and if they are contributing and if they are adding value, you need to ask questions. Huh. If you're asking random questions, definitely it would not be a good idea to ask many questions, right? So now this bit is about critical thinking, right? Questioning. And I told you in the very beginning that you need to have reasonable skepticism, right? You cannot ask anything left, right, and center, right? Somebody saying birds are color blind. So I guess uh, I'm coming from somewhere, sir. So it's not that I make information. I'm coming from some reading. So I would request you to reach out to me. I will help you if you want to know where I am where I, from, where I have given this information. So point is, point is that you need to understand that questioning is important, but your questioning should be reasonable. It should be reasonable skepticism. You cannot ask anything left, right, and center. Wherever you feel there is a gap, you need to ask a question about it. 
right now how does it translate in communication because that's what we have to understand now right so communication is when i when we talk about strategic communication it's about bringing critical thinking skills in communication so when it comes to critical thinking skills in communication what does it imply it implies using the right framework to communicate across well right so normally how do we communicate so there is a scholar his name is aristotle right i'm sure you would have heard of him he has given a model of communication very interesting model he says that if you really want to make an impact in communication you make sense or you try to make use of these three dimensions of communication one is ethos another is pathos and third is logos right it was said thousands of years back huh? but not that that uh, you know aristotle was uh, uh, you know he was just a, a philosopher he actually explored in many areas and he did lots of uh, lots of you know he contributed also immensely or he made a uh, lot, no, lot of discoveries in you know many sciences at that time everything was interconnected now we have silos but at that time everything was interconnected so in linguistics also he has made a major contribution so when it comes to communication he said that first you have to focus on ethos that's called credibility right then you have to focus on pathos which is about emotions and finally there is something called logos that's majorly about logic right whenever you communicate you have to actually strike a balance among these three ethos pathos logos right what is ethos ethos is how credible you are and how much people trust you have to focus on that if you are a smart communicator if you are a strategic communicator before you say or tell anything to anybody right you need to develop a a you know sense of credibility among the people who are ready to listen to you right so for instance there is a psychological hack which is about communication which says that uh, you know some people i'm sure many of you would be like that some people believe that if they they are very clear hearted they don't keep anything in their heart whatever comes in their heart they say it out just give a give give a, a reflective thought to it huh? if anything is coming to my heart i'm saying it out what does it mean it means like for instance i'm rahul chopra if anything comes to my heart i say it out what am i doing i don't want to keep any negative thing with me so i throw it out right i will always think that i am a very good person i don't think anything or i don't think and i think nothing about people on their back i just tell whatever i think about them and that's why i am a good person you may be a good person for sure right but you also have to understand that when you share things without filtering them you are doing it for your self interest because you cannot have or you cannot carry those negative thoughts in your heart right so you want to just throw them out as early as possible and you actually feel really light but you also have to understand that when you say things out they go and impact people who are listening to you right they go and create some kind of an impact on people who you are sharing this feedback with you have to understand that if you keep doing it you would realize if you are like that you would have realized it also that if you are a an upfront person who says things or who come whatever comes to your mind you keep sharing you would have realized that people after some time would have stopped liking you those who are upfront they believe that they should be liked but problem is that they are not liked and they always believe that they are good honest they are clear hearted but still they are not admired for that you all have to understand this is a psychological hack people will listen to you only if they like you and they will like you only when you start with positives but when you always throw negatives and when you don't evaluate your negatives and you don't try to understand how your negatives are going to impact them they will not like you not, not because what you say they will not like you because you are always negative with them and when they start believing you are always negative with them you will, they will not listen to you right so be evaluative when you say things try to understand whether people trust you or not right but if i am a, a strategic communicator and i want to use critical thinking in my communication i have to understand how to develop trust that's also a question right people may not be trusting you 
what is the way to trust so i have to do some soul searching and i have to understand what is my brain's way of developing trust right so when we trust people in our lives like for instance uh, you know our parents our friends our our spouses right i'm talking for group or not one person has spouses so like like our relatives why do we develop trust in them right or for instance you are traveling and suddenly you realize that oh you are in delhi and you are from tamil nadu and somebody say nalla irkiya you plan around oh nalla irkingla you become friends suddenly right tamil tamil how come your brain says a person speaking tamil is your friend right how come you are for instance traveling in uh, you know in a in a local train in bombay and somebody speaking you know bengali and you like wow i speaking bengali suddenly become friends you have to understand your brain picks patterns which i told you in the beginning itself so brain looks for something which it already knows if it already knows it says don't worry i can handle this person so you trust that person so if that person the brain doesn't know anything in that person uh, the, the person is very new so brain says let me see what is same in that person every day because i have to develop pattern so brain always checks consistency in other person so if you want others to trust you bring consistency in your behavior if you don't change your mind every day you don't try to you know become mercurial every day people will like you but if you have mood swings today you are very happy tomorrow you are very sad you go to a party saying let's party together everybody and when you are in a party you say you guys are wasting my time people will not trust you so bring consistency consistency helps in establishing ethos second step of developing ethos is become more transparent the if you are transparent people will trust you because then brain is not uncomfortable with you right my brain is not uncomfortable because by my brain knows what you are thinking based on what you have shared so if somebody is transparent people will trust so if you want to build trust become transparent and finally you have to become predictable people don't trust those who they cannot predict or whose behavior they cannot predict so when you want to be friends when you want to be a great team leader when you want to be a great boss you need to get predicted by your employees if they can predict your behavior that when you good do good things boss becomes happy when you do bad things boss gets upset so when they know they will they will, they know that today they are going to get scolded because they have not done up to the mark thing but if you are confused right you have no clarity right you change your mind when the somebody is doing shoddy work you say wow and when somebody is doing really great work you say very bad work then people will not trust you so consistency transparency predictability helps people to trust you and one very important dimension beyond these three is called expertise if you are an expert then also people trust you because if you are an expert consistency is embedded in expertise predictability is embedded in expertise along with that transparency is also embedded in expertise that's why if somebody is an expert you don't doubt right you have never known this person you have never met this person and you sit in the aircraft which this person is going to fly because you know that the pilot is an expert right so bring ethos give a thought when you are communicating with anybody that's the first step second step is logos what is logos logos is logic right so when you communicate bring logic in your communication now problem is do people bring logic in communication right that's very difficult question to answer not everybody brings logic huh so what is logic you would have come across uh, you know lots of uh, advertisements on television a person will in the uh, you know white coat will come and show you a toothpaste and say this is experts first choice will show you you know something random and say you know doctors first choice and then would say show something from home and say this is uh, you know family's first choice what are they doing are they giving you logic no they are playing with your mind you need to ask a question who are these doctors you need to ask questions who are these experts you need to ask questions like who are these families they never tell you this because they don't have that data they are just bluffing you this is called assuring technique of rhetoric they will very smartly play with your brain by saying no people have said this about you ask this question which people who are these people who are saying things about you question them ask them to become more specific and there is another psychological hack related to it in your offices sometimes we get very worried when people talk on our backs right you all have to understand you should only get worried about any rumor if it is about you only you get worried when rumor is very specific 
For instance, I'm a professor at Excel, right? Excel Arax. If somebody says you're not teaching well or you are not performing well in the class, the class which you were teaching yesterday, then I should get for it because that's a real data. If somebody says, Raul, you are a very arrogant person, I should not get for it. Any information which is generic in nature about you, you should upfront ignore it. Anything which is specific about you, take it very seriously because that can be true, right? So get worried about only those rumors which are specific. Don't get worried about those rumors which are generic. Same applies over here. When it comes to logic, when people give you generic logic, experts have said, people say, ignore it completely. Ask questions. Who are these people? Who are these experts? Which books have you read? People will sometimes bluff you saying it is written in Upanishads. Huh? It is written in Vedas. Ask which Veda you have read. Right? Ask these specific questions. Because problem is we don't read such things. And because we don't read, we have to say yes. So this is called assuring technique. And people use these techniques actually to play with your mind. Right? Similarly, uh, there is something called uh, discounting technique. What is discounting technique? People will actually discount positives about you by introducing words like but. And they will not give any logic. They will say, you are an amazing employee. You are performing exceptionally well. But these days, you are not working well. So these days, you are not working well. Discounts whatever is positive, in the, whatever is told in the beginning. So if you are a critical thinker, you know that positives were not actually told to you. They were just mentioned. But the person is only talking about negatives. By using words like but, the person is discounting your positives and focusing only on negatives. They try to look for discounting. And then there's another technique which is illogical and people play used to play with your mind called rhetorical questions. What are rhetorical questions? They will throw a question saying, do you, so shall we do it? Shall we do it? They will sit in a boardroom and suddenly say, shall we do it? Shall we do it? Let's do it. And you're like, okay, shall we do it or not? In the meanwhile, they've already taken a decision that let's do it. So you will get an impression that you were asked but actually you were never asked, you were informed. When I said, shall we do it? I was never interested in getting your answer. I just wanted to throw a question and right after that question, I threw an answer saying, okay, let's do it. And you never get an opportunity to say whether you want it or you don't want it. And I've already made up my, my mind that I've already actually picked the answer I wanted to choose and I forced it on you. Which was the, the point which I already had on my mind. So people use these techniques, question them. Whenever people are play, using discounting technique, rhetorical questions, supporting techniques, try to become more specific. Look for data. Ask for more information. And when you say something, when you make a point, always substantiate you what you say with reasons and evidence. Right? That is what is called logic. So you are claiming should be substantiated with reasons and evidence. Now, one final thing before I close, right? So that third dimension of Aristotelian model is called pathos or emotions, right? What is pathos, right? Remember, whenever people try to play with your mind, they will never give you time to think because they know that brain is re receptive in nature. And if it becomes reflective, it will be a problem. I will quickly tell you how it works with a story. So, you know, where we live in Jamshedpur, just uh, very close by Jamshedpur, not very close, but close by is a place called Bodhgaya. In Bodhgaya, Buddha got enlightened, huh? Gautam Buddha. So when he got enlightened, no, uh, he was taking a walk in a village and suddenly a lady came. And she said, Ki, you claim that you are God or you talk to God or you're close to God. My son has died. Give life to my dead son. Right? He said, okay, I will give life to your dead son. Because he was a calm, very calm person. He said, I will give life to your dead son. But you will have to do two things for me. First is, you have to look for a house from where you can get a fist full of mustard seeds for me. And second, from whichever house you get these mustard seeds, in that house, nobody should have died. So she said, okay, big deal, I will do it. She went, but in whichever house she went, every house was ready to give her a, a fist full of mustard seeds. But in none of the houses, she could actually get this information that nobody died in that house. So when she was doing this, her brain started becoming reflective. And she realized that she was asking something very wrong from Gautam Buddha. So she came back, said, I'm sorry, I was very emotional. 
I thought my son could come back, but what you have done to me, I realized that actually I'm looking for a wrong answer, right? She went and buried her son. Now, what is the answer of this? What is the lesson of the story, right? Or what was the answer for that lady from what Buddha did to her? What Buddha tried to do that lady to that lady was when somebody tries to pray with your brain by creating fear in you, by creating insecurity with you. That's called manipulation. They force your emotional brain called amygdala to hijack your thinking brain called neofrontal cortex. And problem is that this amygdala brain, which is an emotional brain, is existing with humans for thousands of years. And it is a senior brain. So when it becomes operational, it shuts down all the other brains, especially the thinking brain. And that's why when you're emotional, you're not thinking. So when you are not thinking, you may end up taking some random decisions. When you are very angry or upset, you might be doing lots of random things. But when your prefrontal cortex or neocortex starts working after some time, you realize that whatever you did under the influence of amygdala brain, those were irrational things and you feel regretful, right? So Buddha made her use her neocortex, which was not operational when she was in a deep pain of her son's death. So whenever you are going through a very strong emotion, anger, frustration, you need to give yourself time and make yourself think. Like for instance, talk to people who can make you think. Or again, use critical thinking model. Ask questions. Why am I so angry? Is it good for me to get angry? Why is that person so important to me that I am so angry? Is it going to make any difference? What will happen? You ask these questions to yourself. You would realize that again, you would get in control of your thinking brain. So whenever you are running high on emotions, use it. And if people are using that technique or te that style or method on you, you should ask questions, right? When you ask questions, these manipulators will run away from you because they use emotions and they will never give you any time to use your thinking brain, reflective brain. So always buy in time, put it on your family members, put it on your parents, put it on your siblings, put it on your spouses saying, I will discuss it with my father, I will discuss it with my brother, but take time because they create a sense of urgency in you. And when they create this sense of urgency, what happens is that you become, you cannot think. And when you're not thinking, you will do what you want to do, right? So try to make use of ethos, try to make use of pathos, try to make use of logos. And whenever they're trying to play with your brain, right? ask questions. And one thing it's very important when people are using emotions with you, you have to look for a person who can make you think more, right? Because there's a technique, like for instance, there's a technique where a person will come give you negative feedback saying you're doing bad, but they will never discuss that. Again, they will come and say you are bad. Again, they will come and say you are bad. And after some time, you will start believing that you are bad because of a lie is told to you by a thousand times, you start imagining that it is true. So whenever somebody is doing that to you, you go and discuss it with somebody who's very close to you to understand whether it's true or not. Otherwise, your brain will get controlled by them. Similarly, similarly if there is another technique which normally people use, right? they will actually first remove you from a crowd, give you negative feedback. Why? Because if it is something negative about you and somebody is telling it to you, you will not like to discuss it with others because you believe that you will get exposed. And that is what manipulators know. They know that if I remove this person from the crowd and put negative thoughts into his head or her head, this person will not discuss it with others because this person will get, think that I will get exposed. That lady, that person will get exposed. So they will not like to share their weaknesses. And now they will always come to me to understand what bad, how bad they are or how good or how problematic they are. And then I will slowly or smartly control them. I will start controlling them. So if somebody is trying to play with you by taking you in the corner, giving you negative feedback, don't get into that trap. Discuss it with those who are close to you. Sometimes people use a method called gaslighting. They will make you believe that you are insane even if you are sane. They will try to push their insanity on you. In that case, question them. Always have somebody in your life who should act as a critical thinker, who should force you think, who should make you understand what is wrong and what is right. If you have such people in your life, you can control them. And always keep this little thing in mind that anybody can manipulate you. When you are doing that, you are mindful. If you believe nobody can manipulate you, you actually become blind. And when you become blind, they can actually, you know, play with you, smartly confuse you. So never get into a trap of urgency. Never get into a trap where they actually first isolate you from the crowd and then give, it a, give negative feedback. Look for people who are honest with you, even if they are critical. 
Why? Because brain also has a weakness. If somebody says positive things to you, you start liking those people, even if they are bad people. So they know that if I say positive things, this person can be influenced. Why? Because brain is like that. If somebody gives us positive things or says positive things, our brain releases a hormone called oxytocin, which forces us to trust others. So if somebody is sharing positive things about me, I will, without any reason, I will start liking that person. And if somebody says negative things to us, we will st stop liking that person because when negative things goes to, the, the, that information goes to brain, brain will force your body, your, your gut to release a hormone called cortisol. And then you will start hating that person. So normally we don't like those who are negative with us and we like those who are positive with us. So those who are manipulators, they smartly positively come into your life by giving you positive inputs or praising you for things which for which you should not be praised. And smartly, they will then cornering you for negatives and start controlling you. So even if somebody is negative in your life, but honest with you, try to you know continue a friendship or relationship with you, right? So in the interest of time, because I guess I have received a few messages that time is important. I need to stop here. I can talk and talk. I can teach these things for many days, right? That's what I do here. But uh, I am open to questions. Uh, lots of things I can discuss, but please feel free to ask if you have quick questions. I would be happily taking them. Thank you. Yes, so we Anna. Can take, yeah, we can take one, uh, one or two questions which are there in the Q&A. Okay. Uh, so there's one very interesting question which you can share your thoughts on. What is the importance of perception in professional setups, uh, interacting with professional stakeholders, as well as employees in corporate setups? So when you say perception, uh, you mean how people are perceiving about you? Uh, let us assume that, yes. Okay, fair enough. So I would say that a perception is actually very important, right? If you remember, I told you about the psychological hack, that people will not listen to you until they like you, even if you are saying good things to them or telling the right things to them. Now, perception is something which is developed by others about you. And it will be based on how you communicate with them, right? Or how you interact with them or how you write mails to them. So sometimes that's a psychological hack. I'm not saying you all have to do all the time. There's something called sugarcoating. Sometimes you have to even sugarcoat so that the negative information or strong information or critical information you are sharing, people should have to take because if you start with negatives, People actually, when you say negatives to somebody, you know, brain, body releases a hormone called cortisol. When cortisol is running in your blood, the other person is not listening to you. When other person is not listening to you, whatever good things you tell to that person, that person is not actually concerned about. So start with positives. So definitely perception has a role to play, a very role, important role to play. So whenever you're dealing with your stakeholders, be it internal stakeholders or external stakeholders, start with positives, try to put information, good information first, and then bad information. Definitely, definitely, it will have a right impact on the perception people have. And if you can have very quickly your thoughts on in stressful situations, this is the last question to the forum that we can take. In stressful situations, one tends to be angry while responding. Uh, how to handle oneself? So my suggestion would be there's something called emotional intelligence. There's a beautiful book also called uh, Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goldman. He says that first thing you need to understand is how your emotions are exhibited by your body. What is your modus operandi? First, do this small little exercise on yourself. Try to understand when you're angry, what do you do? When you're angry, do you get physical? Do you get verbally explosive? Do you, you become quiet? When you know how you react when you are emotional, you can actually use your impulses in a positive way, or at least you can actually redirect those impulses in a in a positive way if you are getting angry. So for instance, somebody is saying, I get angry. So there's a small little hack which you can use. Huh? One is that if, for instance, you get quickly angry on something, always give yourself time. So there's a rule called a six to 60 second rule. When somebody is saying something and I try to reply within six seconds, my response will be a reaction. But if I go from six to 60, if I go beyond six seconds, and if I get beyond 60 seconds, from six to 60 seconds, if I try to react, it will not be a reaction, it will be a response. So take time before you respond and give a thought to what you say. You will be able to manage your anger. Very well said. And uh, thank you, Rahulji, for uh, sharing your uh, anecdotes and work experience. Uh, in fact, most of these anecdotes will really come in handy. 
uh, thank you for sharing that with us uh, we will move on to the next topic uh, friends, so before we move on to the next topic, there are a couple of polls that are being announced. You can uh, have a look in the engagement panel. There will be polls for the audience. Now, uh, as we move on to the next topic, I would like to share something which is really interesting or behind the scenes story as we were working on the, today's topic. Uh, Abhay ji, who is uh, incidentally our next speaker on data security, me and him were having a discussion and one very interesting fact uh, came up. Uh, currently, the cost of data security is around 8 trillion. This is expected to go to 10.5 trillion in the next two years. Okay. So, uh, when we speak about data security and protection to your data in an online world, uh, it is a very easy thing to assume that it will not happen It won't happen to me, it will happen to my neighbor. It will happen to my neighbor. Till the time it actually happens. With that thought, uh, I will introduce you, introduce uh, the forum to Mr. Uh, I will introduce Mr. Uh, Abhay Bhargav to the forum. Abhay Bhargav ji is a world renowned security expert with over 15 years of experience in information security. He has heads two security organizations. One is an elite specialized application security services company called WE45. The other is AppSec uh, engineer and online training platform for hands-on skills on application security. Uh, Abhay is a speaker and trainer at major events worldwide, including Black Hat, DEF CON, uh, OW, OWASP, uh, Java One, and more. Uh, Abhay ji is an invited speaker at major security think tank organizations in India, the US, and the Europe. Uh, Abhay ji is also the co-author of an international publication called Secure Java for the web application development and author of an international publication called PCI Compliance, a definitive guide. With that short introduction, Abhayji, I hand over uh, the forum to you. Uh, please uh, share your experiences in the field of data security. Over to you, Abhayji. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you can hear me just fine. Is my volume yes, okay? Sir. Okay, yes, perfect. Abhayji, the volume is okay and we have your visuals as well. Yeah, I'm going to start sharing my screen and please tell me if you can see my screen. Yes, sir. We are able to see your screen. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Tally uh, for organizing uh, this event for CA Day. CA Day, uh, in fact, I, I just a very, uh, I think one of the things that was, uh, you know, I think I should have maybe talked about in the introduction was that I almost became a CA. In fact, I was pursuing CA and I even finished my CPA exam in the US but somehow passion brought me to information security and I've been there uh, ever since. And it's it's been a fun ride, but uh, I really respect uh, a lot of the work that CAs in our country and of course accountants all over the world do. It's quite a complicated job day after day. And uh, it, of course, the taxes, the new regulations and things like that also make it much more challenging uh, for all of us and to run businesses and so on. So. First of all, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. This is a very interesting uh, forum for me to be talking. So most of the time, I talk to very technical forums, which is mostly in, in my own industry. And sometimes that tends to become a little boring after some time because you are talking about the same set of things. So while I was preparing for this talk, I was thinking about what is it that would make sense uh, for this fraternity uh, of people who I'm addressing? And I thought I'll divide my talk into two segments. Uh, the first segment is essentially going to be the state of data security. Now, a lot of you may be aware, some of you may not be aware about the kind of data security incidents that have been happening. And uh, I mean, a short answer to that is that they've only been going up, right? But even then, uh, the date, state of data security, I wanted to talk about first and talk about some of the simple tips that I have for people to follow. Right now, a lot of you might automatically think, OK, these tips might be something that we get in our, you know, uh, from the bank or you get these emails from all over the place. Right. So uh, uh, and your bank or, or any other uh, company will keep sending you a lot of tips. But these tips are a little different from those. And the second. So I'm going to talk about this tips first. I'm going to talk about the state of data security first. And then I'm going to talk about security as an opportunity, because I think CAs, uh, especially in India, have an amazing opportunity that is likely to get bigger and bigger as security needs become bigger and bigger. So I'm gonna talk about this and end my session with this. 
I'm hoping to keep this talk short and simple, and I'm hoping to get a lot of questions at the end of this talk. So let's get started. Um, so my name is Abhay, uh, and uh, I am the founder of two companies. I uh, run two companies, uh, one out of the US and one out of Singapore. Uh, one is called V45, and that's been a company that I've been running for the last uh, 12 years now. And that is a security services company. I started that, uh, like I said, as soon as I finished my CPA, I took a job in a security company, worked there for a year and a half, and then started this company, which is a security services company. We work with clients uh, all over the globe, um, including the US, Europe, India as well. We have a bunch of uh, very interesting customers based out of India as well. I also run a training platform. So I'm very, in essence, I'm a teacher. So in the sense that I do a lot of training, I do a lot of hands-on training on security, uh, especially around things like application security, cloud security. I'm sure all of you would have probably had your own tryst with the cloud. Uh, <clears throat> I do a lot of work in that space as well. <clears throat> Outside of that, I speak at major events. Uh, Black Hat is one of the world's largest security events, uh, which is attended by 28,000 people or so. Uh, there's another one called RSA, which I just finished uh, speaking at. Uh, again, very large security events all over the world. Most of these events are largely based in the US, but there are some events that I speak at in India as well. I'm an author of two books. Uh, both these books are on application security related subjects and uh, one for the uh, payment card industry, which is uh, you know payment card industry compliance space. So this is really my background. So I've been working in the area of security for more than 15 years now. And this is, it's been a very interesting journey and I want to share a few snippets of that journey with all of you today. Now let's start with a story, right? Stories are something that all of us understand. And this story actually uh, is very centered around another accounting software. I'm not talking about Tally. I'm talking about a different accounting software. So let's talk, in fact, the world's largest, probably the world's largest security breach happened because of an accounting software, if you can believe it or not. Now, the year was 2017, and Russia was at war with Ukraine. And you must be thinking, what are you saying? Russia's war with Ukraine started last year. Now, it so happened that that's not true. Russia has been at war with Ukraine since long before this, right? Since 2014, Russia has always had some kind of skirmishes with Ukraine. Russia has had skirmishes with other countries as well, including Estonia and so on and so forth. So in 2017, uh, again, this is allegedly Russia, but still not, uh, uh, they won't take responsibility for it. But most of the world knows that it is from uh, hackers from Russia that perform this. So in 2017, uh, there was this software that uh, most people in most businesses in Ukraine used. This software was called MEDOX. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of it. Uh, maybe some of you uh, who have had uh, business dealings with Ukraine might have used it. Now, this is a software very much like Tally, right? It's one of those very popular accounting and taxation products that was very much very much in line with what you would see with Tally, right? Uh, very, very similar to what Tally does, right? Accounting, taxes. Uh, you, in fact, that was the preferred software for even filing taxes with the Ukrainian tax authorities and so on. So there was this software called ME Docs. And ME Docs, what happened with ME Docs was that uh, allegedly some, uh, some state sponsored hackers were able to compromise their software update process. So I'm sure all of you know this if you're using software, that software tends to get updated quite a few times, right? So whenever there's a new release, it says, hey, there's a new release. Uh, please update the software to the latest version. And you click OK, and then it installs the latest version and so on. Now, uh, the same thing happened there as well. ME Docs, what they did was these Russian hackers or these state-sponsored hackers, they were able to implant their malicious code into the software update process of ME Docs, right? So every time somebody updated ME Docs to get a new tax, uh, you know, to get some new tax updates or to get new updates of the software, they would also be installing this malware along with that update, right? So they installed that so, so of course they compromised the update process everybody installed all and this was a massively used software this was software that was used by any business who's doing business with ukraine so even non ukraine businesses used me docs to file their taxes with the ukrainian tax authorities now as soon as people updated the software 
suddenly they saw that their their entire server started to uh, misbehave, right? When I say misbehave, they were not able to access their uh, their file system at all. A ransomware screen came up on screen and said that you need to pay this much Bitcoin. I'm sure many of you have seen this uh, even uh, outside of that, right? There have been many such campaigns that have happened even afterwards or before that. So they saw this huge screen that said, uh, you need to pay this much Bitcoin. But actually, uh, and we would think that, okay, by paying the Bitcoin, we'll actually get our money back. But it turned out that this was something called Viperware. Now, Viperware essentially means that it would completely destroy the hard drive, which means that anything that was installed on that file system was gone. Even if you paid Bitcoin, it doesn't really matter. It was just a clever ruse to get more delays and people just started losing servers. Hospitals went offline, power companies went offline, um, you know, uh, uh, massive uh, critical infrastructure that controlled nuclear power plants, things like that went offline. And in fact, I'm, uh, there's a company which does a lot of shipping in the world called Maersk. Now, because Maersk had a completely connected infrastructure all over the world, that thousands and hundreds of thousands of servers, all of them went offline at once, which means their ships were stranded on the sea. They didn't have any routes. Their ships didn't have any computing. They did not, they weren't able to communicate. And there were massive delays. Forget massive delays. They were literally flying, uh, sailing blind with hundreds of thousands of ships carrying hundreds of thousands of containers. So this, and, and the only reason they were able to recover was because a single server somewhere in West Africa was offline when the virus spread and it was, there, there was a power outage. We all, I'm sure, uh, you know, commiserate with people who have power outages. So there was a power outage at the time this malware was spreading and this server was offline. And they actually flew in someone from Europe in a private jet to pick up that server from West Africa. And then they were able to restore their infrastructure over a couple of months. So this was the story of one company that had a problem. And you can imagine the kind of global crisis that this created. So the, the story really is that the state of data security today is, is becoming more and more challenging, more and more challenging. I've just given you some, I've put on screen a few uh, major incidents that have happened, not Petya, of course, I just spoke about as a story, but this keeps happening every week. There are new incidents, there are new data breaches, there are new uh, strains of malware, there are new vulnerabilities that keep appearing, there are new actors that keep looking to exploit these vulnerabilities and make money off of them. There are state-sponsored attackers who take these vulnerabilities, weaponize them, and perform cyber crime, cyber wars against companies and countries. So this is a very real state of affairs that we have and we are dealing with all over the world. Now, uh, how? First of all, this looks very uh, horrible, right? All of us, I'm sure, realize that this is this this can be pretty bad it can affect us it can affect us it can affect our neighbors it can affect our uh, our you know our industry at large so this is and it has in fact if you see one of the things that i want to talk about in, in incidents that have impacted your industry just in the last uh, you know month or a year or so this was a pwc they had a breach in their australia office where uh, they uh, they were they were compromised and potentially data was stolen. Of course, uh, you can see the date on the article here, June nineteenth, twenty twenty three. Uh, so this looks like a larger and larger issue that might be growing. In fact, you will see that even in India, we have had several issues of fake income tax applications, uh, which has basically been malware that have been stealing uh, data from uh, phones, from um, from servers, and things like that have been installed and has been causing quite a bit of problem. In fact, uh, in 2020, there is this article which I came across from the uh, from the US uh, CPA uh, fraternity, which is basically saying that the, the incidents, the data breach incidents that have been happening have gone up by 80% uh, since 2014, which means that uh, today, one of the things that I want to talk about and I want to make all of you aware is that Today, attackers think about, just like you think about ROI and I think about ROI, uh, there is 
attackers also think about roi right attackers also think about return on investment today they don't go after one or two companies they don't go after individual companies they go after ecosystems right they go after ecosystems now what does that mean what does ecosystem mean now most of us wouldn't have thought of ourselves as an ecosystem you might be thinking i'm just a ca i have my practice or i am a ca i am working for this company how am i part of an ecosystem now if you are a ca who is running a practice of some sort chances are that you are handling you know several companies or several clients data especially financial data you have automatically become an ecosystem right as soon as you start doing that you start becoming an ecosystem and today attackers are going after those ecosystems because for them they don't want one or two companies they want to go after a lot of them they want to go after an ecosystem which is why if you look at not petia and how it happened with uh, russia and not petia they went after an ecosystem they realized that this software was being used by tens of thousands of businesses all over ukraine all we have to do is compromise this one software and the entire country can come to a grinding halt they realized that and this is going to be something that you will start to see in subsequent incidents as well we have already seen this we are if you look at the industry that i am in you will see that this industry is constantly dealing with these sort of issues ecosystem issues where the attackers are compromising one office or one service provider let's say a software service provider who deals with several clients i'm sure when if you know uh, the kind of companies i'm talking about or a C, uh, or a ca who is handling data sets of multiple clients within their office that is the kind of ecosystems they go after right so this is really one of the things that uh, you have to think about and one of the things that i encourage the reason i brought this up is that all of us generally don't think that what we have is very valuable especially data right that is this constant fallacy we we have within ourselves uh, we always think that we the data that we have is not very valuable but for a third party especially it could be a it could be some third party it could be an individual or it could be a, a cyber crime group or it could be a state or a state sponsored attacker that information could be extremely useful that information could be extremely valid if let us say you are you are handling the data of some company that is bidding or that has certain types of purchase patterns and somebody compromises your organization and then learns of that for you that data okay this is yeah this is transactional data that is important for me to do my job but you don't see it as oh my god this is super sensitive data but for that third party this data is basically gold so one of the things you have to realize is that this is what the attackers are after and this is something that you have to think about actively as a chartered accountant operating in today's almost fully digital environment right today we are dealing with an extremely digitized world we are submitting taxes online we are filing taxes online we are doing accounting through automated transactions we are doing accounting through distributed connected systems uh, we are managing we are getting data from multiple sources there are uh, internal control now those of you who do audits internal control is extensively influenced by the security of these applications so that is something that you have to think about so having said that let's talk about the trends now so far we talked about the incidents let's talk about the trends and when i say trends i largely mean what is happening in the world that the governments or the authorities of the world are trying to deal with right now first of all people the governments finally all over the world have started to wake up to the fact that this is really a national security issue for the countries that are going through this so america for instance has passed a very stringent set of uh, they're bringing in regulation for at the government level in fact this executive order was signed by the president biden and uh, uh, everyone who was on his advisory staff that anyone who sells software to the us government needs to have security in place from the beginning you need to have uh, critical security practices for hospitals and healthcare things like that so this is the kind of things that you are seeing extensively that governments are pushing and not just in the us not just in singapore or not just 
in uh, not, not just in some other European country, but you're also starting to see this in India as well, right? So the US, for instance, this is a new rule by the US Security and Exchange Commission that you need to have somebody, of course, they've had a bunch of cybersecurity regulations in the past, but the latest one is quite interesting because now they're making the board liable for cybersecurity issues. So you need to have a cyber uh, a qualified cybersecurity person on your board for them to take responsibility. So you are starting to see that governments and authorities of different natures, of different sub-industries have started to take this as a very, very, very serious issue, right? So this is this SEC regulation. Uh, Europe has always been extensive in terms of its regulation, and you've started to see this in Europe as well. Uh, there are there are a battery of regulations coming down the pipe. Uh, they like the NIS two and the uh, there's one for the critical infrastructure. They always had the GDPR regulations for privacy. All of this is happening, and they're pushing it down. They're also creating something called the Cyber Resilience Act. So any company handling data in Europe or any ha company handling data even related to Europe is going to fall under. Uh, this particular regulation, and it's going to be quite stringent in terms of uh, what the extent of what it can do. India also, in fact, one of the reasons, uh, I'm sure many of you wonder this, and a show of hands of those who wonder this, how many of you wonder that, hey, why don't we ever hear of these things from India? I mean, why don't we ever hear these incidents from India? Anyone wonder that? Anyone think about that possibility of why you don't uh, hear this from India? There's a there's a reason for that. Now in India, especially with the IT Act of 2000, you do have liabilities for uh, people or breaches that happen within your company and there are breaches of data that happen. But India does not have a mandatory breach disclosure requirement, right? Breach disclosure. Uh, it, uh, Ram Krishna Nayak says no data protection laws in place. There are data protection laws. But there is no need to, to essentially disclose that you've had a breach. So most companies who've had breaches, and I know tons of them who have had breaches, they just sweep it under the rug and essentially say that let's not talk about this because by law, we are not required to disclose the breach in India. And that is changing. The new uh, Data uh, Privacy Act, which is coming up pretty soon, they're going through a bunch of... Uh, I think there are, uh, you know, that's being discussed. And the new Data Privacy Act has very large penalties for companies that have, have been negligent with data security and privacy. And with when they have data breaches, it, the, the, the penalties run into a few tens of crores as well, depending on the kind of data breach that has happened. So this is definitely something that is only going to increase, especially with more digitization and uh, of course, in India, we've all seen the amount of digitization that's happened and is more likely to happen in days to come. This is going to be something that is coming down the pipe for all of us. It's not just uh, it's not just for you know a certain type of companies. Any company that handles data, which is your firm included, is going to require to adhere to these requirements. And that is something that we need to start thinking about. Uh, yes, we can start taking some small steps today, and those of us who can do more things can do more things, but there are a few things that all of us need to start taking a few steps right now and as soon as we possibly can. So first of all, a few data security tips that I have for all of you uh, today. And like I said, these are, I'm trying to keep it as practical as possible. I'm not one of those people who's going to tell you, please don't click on any link. That is, I find that to be uh, pointless. You are going to click on links. Links, uh, unfortunately, are part of life. Uh, and we are going to have to go on the internet. We are going to shop online. We are going to file taxes online. Saying don't click on links is basically saying don't breathe air today. So that is something that is not likely to happen and that will never probably fly as far as we are concerned. So these are a few things that I have for you that you need to think about, especially when you are looking at data security. Now, first of all, everyone talks about strong passwords, right? Now, what is a strong password? So what, what do you think is a strong password? Anyone? Anyone would like to go? Strong password. You can just type it in there, I'm sure. 
mix of characters, alphanumerics, smalls, uppercase. Sure. Right. So that is definitely, uh, yeah, some special character, right? Yeah, definitely some special character, alphanumeric special. Which, uh, once uh, uh, C.S. Samir Singh says, which cannot be predicted, definitely, that is uh, one of the very interesting things. One of the things that I encourage you to think about with strong passwords is entropy, which is basically the com which it basically and uh, the idea of entropy is that it's hard to guess, hard to crack, hard to formulate in someone's head, right? So you have tools that help you give high entropy passwords. So you can probably use that. So high entropy is something uh, that is typically more than 20 bits. So ideally have strong passwords that with high entropy, more than just focusing on the uppercase, lowercase combination stuff that a lot of people try and force on you, try and use high entropy passwords, right? But more than passwords, more than passwords, you need to have multi-factor authentication. Now, multi-factor authentication in a few years ago used to be, yeah, uh, entropy. I'm just going to type it in here. Yeah, so multi-factor authentication essentially means that along with the password, you need to use an additional layer of authentication like an OTP or uh, you know an authenticator app on your phone to be able to enter an OTP to then gain access to your account. Now, this I would say is much more important than your strong password. The reason for this is somebody can potentially fish, do a phishing attack and gain your password. But if they do a phishing attack and gain your password, they still can't get into your environment because you have multi-factor authentication enabled. Wherever possible, it could be on your email service provider, it could be on your different websites that you use. Wherever possible, please start to use multi-factor authentication. Thankfully, in India, for a lot of financial transactions, you already have multi-factor authentication in the form of OTP. But even outside of that, for your Gmail, for your official email, wherever possible, start to use multi-factor authentication. There was a time when multi-factor authentication was super expensive to roll out, but today it's literally free. You can roll this out as part of your, so let's say you're using, let's say Office 365 or Google Workspace or whatever it is for your emails, please ask or force everyone to start using multi-factor authentication. Because if you start using multi-factor authentication, then your attackers will find it very difficult and they will be pretty much sitting like this, trying to get into your system. So one of the things you have to definitely do is have strong passwords, but beyond strong passwords, please use multi-factor authentication. This is really a very important step uh, that I think is going to go much further in protecting you against all kinds of security issues. Because end of the day, Attackers are looking to compromise your account to something and then do something with it. So that something can be protected with multi-factor authentication. The next one is use password managers. Now, a lot of us tend to use the same password everywhere, right? We tend to use the same password all over the place, right? Now, let me just show you a website called, have I been pwned? Okay, you enter your email address here. I'm just gonna enter my email address and it will tell you that your email has been compromised in these many breaches. And you can see how many breaches that it has been compromised as part of. Yeah, the Gmail has multi-factor authentication, Mr. Binod Kumar. Yeah. So you can see that my password has been now exposed in these many breaches all over the world. And this is horrible, right? This is pretty terrible. Now you would think that, okay, now why is this relevant to me? Why is this important? Yeah, it happens, they have breached it, what can I do? I can't help it. Now imagine if I have the same password on all these accounts and I also have the same password on the accounts that I'm using right now these passwords have been compromised. Those passwords can easily be used on those accounts that I'm using right now to compromise all my other accounts as well. This is called credential stuffing. This technique is called credential stuffing and literally because I've used the same password in other places, I can have a scenario where this has been breached. So you'll see that this is 
very, very bad as far as we're concerned. It can have a massive downstream effect. So one of the things that I so one of the things I would ask you to do is use password managers. You do have free open source password managers that will generate passwords for you for each different website. And they will automatically pre-fill those passwords for those websites as well. Please use password managers. The reason for this is that you can't rely on memory, right? You can't just, I'll use the same password everywhere. It's not going to work because these kind of things are happening. The companies that you share your password with are getting breached. As a result of which, your password is now valuable commodity for these attackers. So please, how safe are those password managers? There are some that work on your system. They don't even leave. There are some good ones. There are some bad ones. But most of them that are at least out there today are quite good. I personally, I again, I'm not a, I'm not plugging anyone. I'm not here to sell password managers. But I personally use one password. But there are so many others also on the market. You can just go ahead and take a look and see what works for you. There are free ones as well, by the way. There are very good, uh, you know, free ones like Bitwarden and things like that that you don't need to pay any money for. So that is also uh, options that you have. Two-factor auth will work with, yeah, with certain types of password managers, two-factor auth will also work with, uh, yeah, with some, the thing with commercial password managers. You'll need to pay for that. But yeah, even otherwise, two-factor auth can work with another app, so you don't need to use the same app. All right, so password managers use browsers with ad blockers enabled. Now, this is something that I find a lot of people don't do, and I highly encourage you to do this. Browsers are your gateway to the world, especially with, uh, I'm gonna get to questions a little bit, let me finish. I do have all your questions. I can see that a lot of questions are coming in, which I'm very happy about, but I'm gonna get to your questions because otherwise I'm not gonna be able to finish. Uh, so browsers with ad blockers are, uh, are very important. So most of your browsers today uh, don't come with ad blockers by default. So you might have to install a plugin I use a browser called Brave that is that is ad block by default. It automatically does an ad block for you. The reason, now you might be thinking, why do I care about ads? What does ads have to do with security? So basically what happens on the net, on the web, is that a lot of websites don't know what kind of ads they are funneling, right? So don't know the kind of ads that they're funneling. So a lot of malicious actors buy ad space on certain websites and they push it through several uh, websites through ad networks and things like that. So not only are you getting targeted by ads, which is also selling your data, which is also bad, but a lot of these ads are potentially even malicious. They can do very, very bad things uh, uh, when you're on that particular website. So if you had ad blockers enabled, a lot of the, uh, first of all, your speed of browsing will improve. And the second thing is you'll also get much more security because you're not loading unnecessary, potentially dangerous content on your um, on the uh, on the website uh, on the website that you're using. There are there are multiple plugins, but I would generally prefer you use something like Brave, which is a browser that I use. Again, it's it's like Chrome. Uh, this uh, yeah, so that is something that I typically use, uh, which is which is there. But you can add ad blockers to any other browser as well. The next thing that I would think you should do is educate your staff because you folks might know it. You folks have probably attended this session and know about ad blockers and password managers and things like that. Or you might be knowing it, you might be doing it, you might have already been quite security savvy. But the thing is that one person within your company that has, or one person within your firm that is not aware of this can cause all kinds of issues for your organization. So definitely educate your staff. They're usually the weakest link. Give them the tools, give them how they should use it. Just create a video or you know, just create a PPT with how they should use it and then let them uh, start using it. It's very important that you train people to do this because if you don't, then you will be, uh, you might be doing a great job, but remember your data is not only accessed by you, your data is accessed by your team, your, your uh, the members of uh, who you are, uh, the, the people who you work with, your extended teams maybe. So please definitely look at educating your staff. Now, additional things you can do in terms of data security tips. 
one always run updated software. Now you might be thinking, you just told us about ME docs where the malware was spread because of updated software, but I still maintain that maintaining update, running updated software is a better way to go about it rather than the alternative, which is quite terrible. Always run updated software operating system and upwards, right? Definitely please run updated software. And if you are, a lot of times I've seen that people uh, need to use the internet, especially at the workplace, try and use an internet proxy. Uh, you can buy commercial services. You have, you, you can implement something in your firm. There are multiple things you can do, but this prevent the access to all kinds of random websites. And really internet is a vast and uh, crazy space that has a lot of potential danger in it. So definitely try and use internet proxies for work machines at least. Maintain cloud backups. Now, ransomware is one of the biggest threats to uh, a CA firm that I can think of, right? There are other things as well, but ransomware is huge because it literally decimates your ability to access your own files. So I would maintain a cloud backup simply because on the cloud, it is separate from your system. It is a separate application that requires separate protocols that need to get on the cloud. So I would maintain a cloud backup simply because on the cloud backup, it's unlikely or much lower likelihood of ransomware spreading in that particular cloud backup. So even something like uh, in a backup service on Amazon or Google or whatever it is, is still better than having local office backups because you're all on the same network. That backup is useless when it's on the same network because ransomware that's on one machine can easily spread across the network, across the local network in that case, definitely more. And a lot of us, uh, maybe cloud backup, yeah, they also keep it in encrypted form, absolutely. They do keep it in encrypted form as well. You do have encryption options as well. Now, cloud email services, one of the things that I've seen is that there's a lot of skepticism uh, for the use of cloud services, especially in our country. And uh, I think it's very important to understand that they do a much better job of securing things than we do. Uh, because we don't have the management capability to ex constantly sit and patch and secure things like that. Uh, so we definitely, I would recommend using cloud email services, much harder to compromise, much more uh, security features built in. So I prefer that, but again, I'm not, again, not selling you cloud email, but this is just my, uh, in my two, two cents on the top. Um, can this presentation be shared? Of course, I'll share it with the tally folks and they can share it with you. All right, now, so far we have discussed a few scary prospects, we have discussed a few tips, but I also see security as a very useful opportunity for this fraternity. I think CAs are a great partner to the businesses that they support. And I think that security is another opportunity for chartered accountants as days go by, and especially based on the trends that I just spoke of. So I think things like this, right? Uh, I think that chartered accountants, either partnering with companies or doing them yourself should definitely get into security services. Now, one, the security services space is severely underrepresented, even in a country like India, where there are so much talent, there are so many people, even there, um, that is still uh, an issue, right? So definitely I would recommend that chartered accountants start thinking about it. Either equip yourself, maybe get into, I, I'm sure the ICAI has some initiatives for IT and IT audit, but beyond that, start to maybe think about a CISSP or start to uh, do these security audits or maybe partner with a company that can do security audits because not only is it a very financially viable uh, you know, business model, uh, but it is also a completion of services from your perspective, right? As far as you're concerned, these services can help you add more value to your client. So you should definitely consider doing it. And since you know the client's business, you know the client's business challenges, you know the client's business risk, you are in a great position to start thinking about giving these services. So things like, for instance, uh, security audit of applications. Now, applications are where a lot of these security issues tend to get identified and uh, found, right? So anything that relates to applications and ERP or a combination of both these things, you should be auditing a lot deeper because 
the entire notion of internal control comes from uh, these applications, right? So that is something that you have to think about from that standpoint. So I definitely encourage you to start thinking about this uh, from that standpoint. Regulatory services, now with the government introducing new regulations and not just government, but even foreign governments that apply to uh, local companies might be introducing a lot of different uh, regulations. And those regulations also need to be managed, right? Somebody needs to navigate the complexities of those regulations. And you are, again, ideally placed to do this. You understand the company, you understand the client, you understand the potential regulation. You can maybe uh, partner with a law firm, partner with a security company, and then maybe have some regulatory services. Cyber insurance right now is still a very small industry in the uh, in India, but it is going to get much bigger because you're going to see more and more breaches. And when data breach laws become real, cyber insurance is going to be a huge uh, opportunity. It's already a huge opportunity in the US. Uh, a lot of the places that I work in, uh, cyber insurance is a mandate and, and cyber insurance is also running into a lot of security issues uh, in terms of you know how to evaluate what is the kind of uh, breach that has happened, things like that. So cyber insurance consulting may be another area that you can get into as well. So these are definitely um, you know uh, things that I would uh, encourage you to start thinking about because you are already trusted partners for your clients' businesses, right? You already understand what they do, you understand their business. And end of the day, security risk is business risk. Right, security risk is only a subset of business risk. Just like you have business risk of you know the financial risk, your reputational risk, all of that stuff. Security is a subset of those risks. So understanding a security risk is really a question of equipping yourself with those specific skill sets that help you understand that, or maybe partnering with someone that has those specific skill sets. And like I said, the regulatory and compliance requirements are only going to go up. Uh, in this country and in the con in, in the countries that this country interacts with, these requirements are going to be mandated. Uh, in fact, just this afternoon, I spoke to a, a client who's who has these EU regulations that have been spun up on them, and they are based out of India, and they need to do a whole bunch of security, uh, you know, uh, security work for them to get compliant with that, and that can help as well. So it can definitely help your practice as you go into it in a bigger way. So yeah, with this, I uh, wanted to conclude my talk. I hope I've given you both perspectives, both the scary perspective of what has happened in the world of security, and of course, given you some possible opportunities that you can leverage off of and given you some practical tips as to how you can uh, you know, protect yourself and your firm as well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Vaisal. Very crisply summarized and leaves us with a lot of uh, thoughts to ponder over as far as how data uh, security can shape up in future. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, I, I would request you if you can quickly scheme through it and see if there are a couple of relevant questions can be taken up. Yeah, uh, so looks like a couple of questions relate to the presentation. I'll just share that with you folks and you folks can probably share that with the broader uh, community, I guess. So if your system is hacked, ransom is demanded in such a situation, whether one should pay ransom, if you do not pay, you will lose critical <clears> data. <throat> yes. Now, now, Ajay Jain has asked a very relevant question. Uh, see, uh, ransomware is, is basically a gamble, right? Uh, when you pay the ransom, you might get it, you, you might not get it. There is no guarantee that you'll get it. End of the day, they're thieves. Think about it. Will you trust uh, will you trust a thief? It's just a question about that. And it really depends on the situation you are in, the desperation related to that situation you are in. I've heard of people who have got their uh, data back, uh, but I've also heard several cases where they're not. So it's very hard to say with any definitive way uh, that you should. So that's why I'm thinking that you should, things like cloud backups and things like that, I would rather focus more on the preventative than the uh, you know, the potential corrective mechanism. So I I, uh, I would not be able to give you a definitive answer here, but this is my, uh, you know, perspective. Is it safe to save a banking password on a password manager? Yes, definitely. 
depends on the password manager, but most of them are pretty good. Yeah. OTP based authentication is good. Yes, OTP based authentication is okay. It's still considered not sufficient by most of the Western world because you can do SIM swap attacks and things like that, but it is still better than having no other two factor authentication. Uh, how safe is it to use a password manager? How do these work? Now, a password manager is basically like a database of passwords that store your password in a highly encrypted form. Um, and uh, that basically will, uh, you know, that that will give you access to the password when you need it, but only allow you to access it when you have a master password. So that is uh, always run updated software, but Ukraine breach happened as part of regular. <laughs> yeah, I said, uh, like I said, I, I still may, I, I, I brought that up when I was talking about it. Uh, yes, that happened because of that. But I, I still feel the cost of uh, updating your software is a much better trade-off than having to deal with old, outdated software that can be vulnerable to a lot more attackers. So that is the way I see it. Is data over Google Drive secure? It's a very, um, that again is a very subjective question. Google Drive by itself is very secure, but the data you load on it are files and folders. So it really depends upon how you give access to it, how you synchronize it. All of those things make a big difference. Um, right. Okay. So, so uh, Abhayji, if we want to take a couple of most relevant questions, because in for interest of time, we'll have to really use discretion. I will yeah. leave that to you, uh, which can benefit the most of the audience. Okay. A small question, sir. Whether the documents used for PDF merger or conversion, etc., on sites, I love PDF are safe. They're not safe. Definitely, please don't use it. Try and download something and use it on your local machine. I know this. And I've had the pain of using it. If it's not a sensitive document, maybe it's safe. But if it's a sensitive document, please don't use these random third-party websites that do PDF merge and all that. There are a lot of it is malware. Um, even after using antivirus, can someone steal data from our PC if you're on the internet? Okay, now this is a good question because antivirus is a very loaded topic. Now, antivirus is a set of signatures, okay? So let me explain how an antivirus works. An antivirus is basically a set of signatures. Uh, it basically stores the signature of different viruses and malware in the system, in its own database. If the signature is found, it will say that, yes, I found the virus. And it will say that I've been able to stop the virus, blah, 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 blah. But there are lots of malware that is bypassing those signatures. Remember, the, the crook is always trying to stay two steps ahead of all of us. So they're constantly trying to come up with evasion and using different kinds of signatures to bypass all these things. So it's naturally not, it's not 100% effective. It helps, but it is not 100% effective, not by a long shot. Uh, okay. Most in many information, whether downloading is risky, it really depends on the open source type. Uh, how would one actually come to know that there is a cyber attack? Uh, it really depends on the nature of the cyber attack. Sometimes it's financial. You might see money is missing one day and you might know that, okay, this is uh, something that I didn't do. Uh, or it might be that somebody received some instruction from you that you never sent. So that may be a way you can identify that there has been a cyber attack of some sort. But it really is subjective, uh, very, very subjective. Internet proxies. Now, one of the things, in, so internet proxies are basically configured on the, uh, on the machine. So let's say I have a laptop, I can configure an internet proxy and that proxy will basically not allow me to access certain types of dangerous sites. So if by chance I access some dangerous site or potentially harmful site, that proxy will flag that off and tell me that, hey, you know what, this is a malware site or this is a restricted site, you should not access it. So they will protect me from a lot of unintended harm that I could bring upon myself. So that's the reason, that is what a proxy is for. It acts as a communication channel between you and the open internet. That's what proxy does. Right, so I think I've answered most of the questions, I think. So yeah, so I'll take it from here. Uh, Abhayji, thank you so much. So thank you for sharing your experience, friends, this evening uh, itself, where we had two uh, notable speakers speaking about communications and data security. 
uh, as our uh, topic leaves us with a lot of thoughts to build from here and take uh, our professional journey ahead. Uh, we thank you for your presence and extend our word of thanks. In fact, we would like to give a special mention and word of thanks to ICTPI team and uh, AIF, uh, AIFTP in supporting our CADA programs and sharing it with their members. A uh, special thanks to Sridhara Par uh, Parasarthi Sarji, uh, chairman of ICTPI, for always being a well wisher of tally. There are a few polls that are being there. You may participate. Uh, for the, as far as this session is concerned, uh, please write to us your feedback, uh, the uh, your your candidate feedback, your appreciations, what you think we can include on help at the rate tally solutions dot com. Uh, Hope to see you in our upcoming events with Tally. There is something called a CA community page on our website. Uh, do have a look there. We keep sharing information and we keep doing a lot of all around the year CA Connect events. So thank you everyone for being there. Uh, with that, we will conclude our 75th uh, day, CA Day celebrations at Tally. Uh, signing off.